Hi and welcome to a CDH tier list video. Now I've actually made my opinions about CDH tier lists before in the previous videos. And my statement is that it's very complex. There's a lot of things to take into account. So it's very hard for a person to just sit there and talk about their opinions about all various commanders and rank them in a good way. But what if we ask the simple question, how would commanders be ranked if we place them in order from top to bottom with the highest to lowest win rate? You see, we just had a CDH tournament, CDH top deck expo finished with a size of 205 different entries. And over a long period of time, I have been collecting various different entries into my calculations. So for example, here we have the winner of this CDH Top Deck GG Expo is Chrome and Tumina with five wins and four draws. And if you just calculate everything, you can figure out a average win rate on every single possible commanders. So in this case, Tumna and Chrome, we have 372 different entries and they are getting an average win rate together of 26.04. And if you do that for every commander, you end up with this leaderboard. And it would give us a form of CDH tier list. Or a CDH uh, ranking of sorts. But there are a few things we actually need to go over. Specifically this one first. Too few games. What does that mean? You see, some commanders aren't just popular enough. If you look here, Tim and Chrome, we have a lot of entries. Nayela, a lot of entries, Tivit, a lot of entries, but if we flip this and we look at the lowest amount of entries first, we have a lot of commanders that have just entered into one tournament one time only, and if we keep scrolling down, like quite a, a lot, eventually we're getting to a lot of 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s, and here we're starting to get to like 9. So here we have Narset, Enlightened, Exile. And as you can see, with only 11 games, Narset ends up in the section of too few games. Narset actually sits on a pretty decent win rate 24.66, but from only 13 decks. Which ultimately kinda means that we can't trust that win rate, so Narset can't enter into the actual CDH leaderboard that I've created. We also have another example, Kalia here, who is sitting on a amazing 26.73 average win rate and would theoretically make it into one of the best commanders possibly like s tier level but only seven games so it can't go into the actual leaderboard another example is heliot the radiant dawn with 12 games and an average win rate of 28.30 which would also make it into like s tier level one of the best commanders possible but only from 12 games, so we can't trust the win rate. However, I wanna explain something very important here. And this is gonna sound a little bit strange, but I actually think that that win rate might be correct because of one of the biggest, or the biggest advantage with Heliod is that people just don't understand it. If that entry level was higher, the win rate would go lower because more people would go up against Heliod and learn more about Heliod, and the more people know about Heliod, the more people are going to interact with it. Because when Heliod enters into tournaments, people just assume it's a casual deck and bad, and the truth is, Heliod actually works. It can pack a punch, it can win pretty amazingly. But people underestimating it will give it a better win rate, because when people underestimate things, that's when you get away with doing whatever you want. So there are some interesting takeaways just by looking at this. But in general, the commanders that just have too few games on are Akiri, Tevesh, Akiri, Thrasius, Animar, Braids, Dargo, Ikra, Elsha, Isika, Exodus, Florian, Yen, Jason, Narset, Marnius, Maraf, Krok and Kunoros, Tevesh and Krom, Krark and Tumna, Sakashima, Kodama, Kes, Kalia, Jensen, Heliod Radiant, Tumna and Frasius, Shalai and Halar, Slicer, Vadric and Idris. 
But over time, as more people are playing these commanders, they will end up inside the CDH leaderboard that I have. Which actually takes us to D tier, which are commanders on a average win rate of 14 or lower. And the basic verdict is that don't play these commanders inside CDH tournaments, or well, you should play whatever you think is best for you, what you consider fun. But the takeaway here is that this is not recommended. So here we have Bralin and Shabras, of course, Cormella, Derevi, Evelyn, Gitrog, uh, Jeska and Shai, Yetmir Omnath, the four CMC locus of creation, Cities and Tassigur. And they are all uh, more or less performing quite bad. They do range a little bit, like Sutis is almost at that above 15% win rate, which would take her to the next tier. Gitrog is also kinda close, and Tassigur is also kinda close. I remember people talking about Yetmir for commander and the competitive commander, so 13, I'm gonna say 14% for Yetmir, so yeah, not so good. Evelyn is sitting on 7.14 average win rate, which makes her into one of the weakest commanders, uh, so to say. This takes us to the C tier. Now, here we have commanders with an average win rate of 15 or up to the average win rate, which is 22.5, which is B tier. B tier is basically the average above the average win rate to 25%. You see, the average total win rate is just something that we calculate from calculating all commanders that we have basically brought into this calculation and get an average win rate from that, which is 22.5. And that makes the separation between C and B. So if you are above the average, you get into the B tier. If you are below the average and above 15, you get into C tier. In other words, if you have an average win rate above, let's go 23%. Let's say if you have an average win rate of 23%, that means you're better than the total average of all CDH players that have entered into tournaments. So now you can put yourself in a form of a leaderboard. Anyhow, in C tier we have Brea, Frasius and Bruce, Captain Cisse, Dargo and Tymna, Dihada, Etali, the Gruul Etali, Godo, Ikra and Krom, Kedis and Malcolm, Kodama and Tymna, Korvold, Krik, Magda, Minsk, Nivmiset, Parun, Obnixilis, Paco, Prosper, Rafine, Rocco, Krom, no, Tevesh and Rograk, Rograk and Frasius, Shurkai, Talion, Tivit, TNT, Tumna and Frasius, Ursa, Vinota, Yurko and Sur. And as they average between 15 to 22.5, you can have Godo that's sitting like 18.39, Kedis and Malcolm at 21, or I'm gonna say 22 uh, average, which is putting it very close to actually getting into B tier. Magda is extremely close into getting into B tier, she's sitting on 22.13. But then you have commanders like Obnixilis that is sitting on 43 game entries and an average win rate of 15.61. Rafine Scheming Seer is also a commander I kinda wanna point out. It's sitting on 16.48 average win rate, playing Esper. Dargo Tymna was also among the pair here, 19.44 average win rate from 22 decks. Captain CC, 18 decks have entered into tournaments, we have an average win rate of 18.89. Very close to 19. Mono Black Krik has a lot of entries and it's uh, 56 entries and it's getting an average win rate of 18.79. Yuriko the Tiger Shadow is actually a really popular commander. She has 105 entries, which means that she's played quite a lot. She's sitting on a 20.55 average win rate, which means that she is definitely lower than the total average, but it's not terrible. In the end, if you're playing Yuriko, you are gonna win a few games here and there, but it's not gonna be one of the commanders that is like 
taking away the tournaments in Storm. Another ultra popular commander among the C tier section is Venota on 94 games, but she's definitely dropped. She's sitting on an average win rate of 16.51 which means that she's very close at actually entering into the C, uh, D tier. And I would honestly say that she's definitely on the edge of maybe she's not really recommended actually. Maybe you should uh, play something different. But once again, you should play what you personally enjoy and what you consider fun. But this is not a commander that is an overall performing great among various different tournaments. Tivit is actually among one of the most popular commanders inside this format. 236 entries and an average win rate of 22.18, which means it's extremely close into getting into the B tier section of an average win rate better than the total average. Currently, it's actually lower than the total average, but still not that far away from it. In the end, the verdict is basically that Tivit will definitely win games from now and then, but it's not gonna be a command that is gonna be dominating the scene. It's gonna win some tournaments, but it's... Uh, I would say it's still among the underdogs of sorts. Naya Rocco is another popular commander with 82 entries into various tournaments and an average win rate of 21.82. So it's also very close at actually getting into B tier. I hope this gives you a small picture of all the commanders in general that's in C tier. I haven't showcased everyone. If you wanna see the specific details of any one of these specific commanders actual win rate, leave a comment below and I will give you the information. I only decided to look into some of the more popular ones. That takes us to B tier. I already showcased this a tiny bit, but this is basically the tier where you have a win rate between above the average win rate of 22.5 towards 25 average win rate. So here we have Tumna and Tana, Bloodpod, Dargo and Frasius, Inala, Tumna and Jeska, Joira, Wedderite Captain, Kenrif, Kinnan, Krark and Sakashima, Malcolm and Tumna, Nayela and Tevesh and Frasius. So let's go over them one by one. So we have Tymna and Tana making Blood Pod, very popular, very old deck. Used to be played quite frequently, now it's dropped. 38 decks have entered into various tournaments with it, and they have received an average win rate of 24.08. So they are actually like very close at getting into the A tier section. Then we have Dargo and Frasius, and they actually deserve its own average win rate discussion. I kind of want to talk a lot about these two, because they used to be the best. I'm not joking here. For a super small second, until the most recent tournament, they were considered the best commander, or well, they weren't considered, but according to my calculations, they were the best. They were sitting on a 26 you can actually see that, by, by the way, up there. So you have an average win rate currently from 72 games, which is on 24.58 average win rate. However, adding the most recent tournament, they have dropped by 2.26%. The big reason why this commander pair was so good or had an, such an amazing average win rate around 26, not that long ago, was because the only people who actually played Dargo and Frasius were more or less hardcore CDH veterans that played a lot of these uh, commander games in tournaments games in general. And they know the format, but they also they were quite good at playing specifically Dargo and Frasius. Which means that they were basically only good people playing this commander pair. And if you only have good people playing this commander pair, the win rate is actually kicked up quite a lot. For example, we did take a look at Kalia, who is mostly played by really good Kalia pilots, and therefore Kalia is getting a pretty amazing average win rate. But now when more people are playing this commander, and over time as more people are playtesting it and such, I think that the win rate is going to drop or stay around something of this sort. Because if we go back to Tivit, who has a 236 entries, we are basically excluding the player skill factor. We're having players 
that are good at this commander and good at this format, and we have players that are bad at this commander and bad at this format. And you're getting a more clear picture of how good this commander actually is. That was Dargo and Frasius. let's move on to the next one. Which is Inala. From 38 games, she has acquired a 24.86 average win rate, which is extremely close into pushing her into A tier. I should actually mention that she has been in... Okay, so I've been calculating this leaderboard for a while, and until I had like enough sample size and until I had a good format to actually present it like this, she has been in A tier before according to my calculations. Now, she has a... She has a calculation of games, 38 of those, but that means that once there is a new game with an ALA, the win rate actually spikes up and down quite a lot. Compared to something like Yuriko, if Yuriko goes in and wins a tournament, her spike in win rate doesn't become that huge, just because when you're calculating the average from 105, you just don't have that huge impact, so to say, in the calculation. So I do think that the few games for a while is gonna make Inala quite spiky, she's gonna jump up to A, she's gonna jump down to B, but B, but in the end I think she's gonna land somewhere around this count. This current win rate feels kinda accurate for her, she's definitely a very strong commander, Grixis colors, great, and she has a one card combo with Spellseeker, which none of the other Grixis commanders actually have. Next up is Tumna and Jaska, not much to say, Pretty good, solid Mardu shell. Three colors. Mardu is actually quite good. You have a card drawing the command zone with the Tumna, and you have an infinite mana outlet from Jeska. In other words, it's very similar to TNT. You're just swapping blue and green into red, which opens more combos. But you can still win with infinite mana the same way that Frasius is winning with infinite mana. Next is Joyra Weatherlight Captain, and I wanna emphasize that she's also quite jumpy. She's going into A tier, she's going into C tier, into B tier, where she's currently standing, but she doesn't have an enormous amount of games. From 33 deck entries, she has an average win rate of 24.39. So she's basically performing quite okay. And I think that uh, with more games, my personal prediction is that she's going to drop a tiny bit. I think she's gonna land around 23 if I'm making a guess uh, here. Kenrif, the Return King, is a heavily played commander. He's sitting on a 93 deck entries and an average win rate of 23.90. Which means that he's actually quite close into getting into A tier. He's actually been increasing a tiny bit over the time. Now he did make a small decrease from this most recent tournament, but overall I've usually seen him a little bit lower. The more games we have with Kendrick as a personal prediction here, again, I don't think he is going to get into A tier. Ultimately, I think it's gonna stick around into B tier because it is a very solid all around five color identity commander A little bit expensive CMC from the command zone, but it can do so much Reanimate creatures, draw cards, gain life, gain trample So he has a lot of value, but in general, I think he's gonna struggle to get into the A tier section Which are like close to best among the best then we have Kinnan, and here I actually want to talk quite a lot. So Kinnan is a very popular commander. He has a 240 deck entries and an average win rate of 22.98, which means that he's actually quite close into dropping into C tier, one tier lower. And this is actually surprising me, and this is actually why I really like making these CDH tier lists or these CDH rankings in this form of way, because if I were to be forced at gun point trying to make a CDH tier list, I would probably rank him like higher. Because my personal belief is that Kinnan is actually an A tier commander. But apparently he is struggling. Or I shouldn't say struggling, like he's in B here currently and almost 23 average win rate is pretty okay, it's quite good. But I thought personally that he would be above 25. He's been dropping a little bit over time. Actually, he has been in A tier, but he has been steadily dropping. Don't know why. 
if you have any ideas of such, I'm not personally a Keenan player myself, I play against Keenan from now and then, so I've seen his potential, but if you have any ideas why Keenan would get this kind of win rate in general, please leave that comment below, I would love to read your beliefs, or your ideas and your predictions. Maybe he will, cre he will increase over time, who knows. Krark Sakashima. I hate these commanders. I truly hate these commanders. Now, let's actually explain in detail why I personally hate Krark Sakashima. You see, I'm making gameplay videos and they are horrible to edit. I really don't want to have Krark Sakashima among my gameplay videos because, once again, they are so horrible to edit. But they are good. They are actually quite good. I have always believed that Krark Sakashima is pretty amazing. One of the big reasons is that they are a little bit, like, under the radar is a good word for it. People don't take them that serious. It's not Grixis, it's Isset. So, they are in the area of, like, casuals, so to say, in people's eyes. But they do perform. I have lost to these command this commander pair a bunch. Once you get both of these commanders into play, you usually just take over the game. <laughs> I could honestly see these two actually climb higher. I'm gonna be honest, I truly believe these guys could reach A tier. There are so many different new cards that could be printed that would increase their potential of what they can actually do. Then we have Malcolm and Tumna, also quite popular. 62 deck entries and an average win rate of 23.05. This makes them into the best Esper commander, better than Tivit. Better than Rafir, better than Sur. Sur was actually among the section of too few games to actually say something. We only have 14 games, but the average win rate from those 14 are 17.14. So yeah, Malcolm and Tumna is clearly performing better and also winning the popularity vote, which is an indicator that it's probably better. Because when there's a very few people playing something, it's an indication that people have been opting away from that commander. So in the end, Tumna and Malcolm, the best Esper commander pair. Then we have Nayela. Now I wanna say pretty much the exact same thing I said about Kanan for Nayela. She's also very popular. So 261 decks have entries into tournaments, and she has an average win rate of 23.27. But here's the thing, it's been dropping. Nayela, in my previous calculations, have actually been in A tier. She has been above 25 average win rate. And I don't honestly know why she's going down. It could of course be that there's a lot of inexperienced players piloting Nayela. But with this high count of 261, I don't know anymore. Or well, I actually have an opinion about it, but we're gonna get to that soon when we talk about another commander that is also five colors. You see, uh, my personal belief why Nayela might be dropping is that she is a five color turbo commander, but that's it. She doesn't have a card draw mechanic from the command zone. She's basically just a combo piece from the command zone. Now, I will agree that she has a big punchy plan, pre producing a lot of tokens, that is eventually just swarming your opponents. But it's very rare that I see that happen. Like, I don't, I don't remember a single game where I've died to Nayela Beats. But we will be talking more about Nayela in the future. Let's proceed. To the TT, uh, Frasius and Tevesh. With 27 game entries, they have an average win rate of 24.26. So they are performing quite okay. Now, the very low count here is an indicator that I believe that the people who are playing these two together are basically very talented players. This commander pair is not gaining the popularity vote, which means that the casual players aren't really picking up this commander that much yet. So I think that the win rate here is a indicator of just a bunch of skillful players in general, I could absolutely be wrong on that. But I personally think that the average win rate uh, might drop if over time, where more people might be playing it. Those were the commanders in B tier. Now we only have 7 commanders left, because in A tier we only have Cisse and Tyam. Let's actually begin with Tyam that is sitting on uh, exactly 25 on 
0.25 average win rate, which does make it go into A tier, but I mean, if you look at that, minus 0 0.30, it is close at dropping into the B tier section. Actually, a lot of commanders were recently in A tier, Nayela was recently there, and they just dropped into uh, B tier. And if I'm gonna be honest, I do think Tyam is going to drop a tiny bit. I don't know how much, I don't think it's gonna drop all the way down to C tier, I think it's gonna stop in B and hang around in B for a while. But I do think it's actually going to struggle keeping that 25 average win rate. Now this takes us to Cise. She's currently sitting on 146 games and an average win rate of 25.23 and she's honestly been holding her ground inside A tier for quite a while. Cece is actually a commander that had been, over time, been performing mediocre, but over time increasing her win rate more and more. And the reason for that is actually quite simple. She is a legendary focused commander with access to all five colors. She is also quite cheap, like you get her into play from a Yule Lotus or just land and mana crypt on turn one. But the fact that she desires legendaries means that she is the commander that is receiving the most upgrades from every single set. Because, I mean, to be honest, Wizards of the Coast are printing legendaries quite frequently. And among those that Wizards of the Coast are printing, she's continuously getting upgrades from now and then. Like Kinnan made a huge improvement for her, Esika a huge improvement, Lofo have been a huge improvement, and I do believe that the new cat, the new legendary Grand Abolisher, for free mana will be an amazing improvement for her as well. I'm actually going to be so bold to say this once again. I've said this before and I will say it again. I personally believe that Cissé, Weatherlight Captain, is going to be the best commander inside the entire format. I think she's gonna get into S tier, and I think she's gonna hold her ground in S tier. And the reason for that is simply because I just believe that Wizard of the Coast are going to print so many cool cards that eventually she will just have the tools and toys to just dominate. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here we have a Displacer Kitten, Emil the Blessed and Dockside Extortionist. We are currently looking at how many decks among all decks that I've looked at. We have a total of 3740 decks and among those we have 64 decks that are playing all three of these cards together in the same deck list. Ignoring the commander. So we basically have Frasius and Bruce, Frasius and Akiri playing this, but we also have Cisse playing this. We're not really looking at the performance of a commander here. We're looking at the performance of a combo. And yeah, spoiler alert, we will have a CDH combo tier list in the future as well. But we have to mention that Cisse is actually really good specifically with this combo because she can tutor for Emil the Blessed, Emil the Blessed being legendary. Same thing can be said with the Displacer Kitten, Mox Amber, Mox Opal and Teferi Time Reveler. She can tutor for Mox Amber or Mox Opal, but she can also tutor for Teferi. Another popular combo that have been emerging in Frasius Bruce decks, I've looked at that, is Derevi, Emil the Blessed and Gaia's Cradle. But here's the thing, Cise can tutor for all of these four uh, free cards. So a big reason why I believe that Cise is going to grow in power is that we're going to generate more and more commanders with combo potential, but Cise is basically the one to rule them all as she can tutor for all of these various legendary combos. And this is why I think Nayela, I mentioned that we were gonna go back and talk about Nayela, why I personally believe Nayela might be dropping is because Cise is offering more or less the same thing, all five colors, same commander uh, costing cost, and both of them have a very pretty good turbo combo potential. Like, you can build Cisse in so many different variations of ways. I honestly believe that if I'm gonna criticize the, C the Cisse community currently, and they disagree with me, that that's fine. I, this agreement is perfect. Some of them will uh, agree with this though. That Cisse should be starting to explore other things than the typical traditional Cisse stuff. I believe that Cisse 
should start to experiment with ad nauseum necropotence or other Grixis experiments. For example, here is my current version of today's Cisei. I've actually cut Teferi as an experiment, I'm playing the new cat, I talked about that most recently. But I've also played the new card Orcish Bowmaster, but I want to showcase... Where is it? Here, Mnemonic Betrayal. So Mnemonic Betrayal isn't really a typical CSA card in general. But in my personal experience observing the card, I've noticed that it's actually performing quite well in general when my opponents are playing it. And looking at game stats in general, I've noticed that Mnemonic Betrayal in the most commander decks that do include it is actually performing quite good. And it's an easy card to include inside Cise because it doesn't really take up that much spot or space. So Cise can still be the very typical Cise stuff, stacks, creatures and turbo, like Lofo is good here. I even have Nayela inside this decklist, Kinnon is great. But you can easily include things like Mnemonic Betrayal, I play a bunch of counter spells, I have Wishclaw Talisman. And I want to mention that I have had have thoughts about including Bon Upon a Wind, Final Fortune and Necropotence inside Cisei as well. It is a combo that is actually performing quite good. You can see here we have 104 decks that have included all of these three cards together and they are receiving an average win rate of 25.90 which is taking very close to an S tier level. But I'm not going to bore you with more CC talk, it's time to go into S tier level. S tier can actually be summarized quite easy. The 5 decks that have the highest win rate, that's it. In other words, all of these are pretty much A tier, or very close to A tier, which means that some of the A tier commanders like CC and these guys will be swapping place from now and then. But the current best five commanders, not from my personal opinion, but from tournament performance are, not in any specific order, Atraxa, Blue Farm with Tumna and Krom, M Tropical Malcolm, often referred to as Malcolm and Tana, Rogsai with Rograk and Silas, and I couldn't resist putting Valakut in the end there, but not specifically Valakut, but Thrasius and Smasher. Sans white. Let's begin with Atraxa. Sans red, 7 mana, super expensive commander, have usually been the best commander inside the entire format, but over time been dropping. She's sitting on a very high inclusion rate, or well, 139 decks have played her, and an average win rate of 25.36. But once again, it's actually dropping. I have seen her up at 25, uh, 27 average win rate, but I think, if I'm gonna be honest, that she's gonna s keep on dropping. I actually have a card review for Atraxa, and my verdict was that I don't think she's good. I think that 7 mana is just too expensive, but I've been proven wrong. She is good. And the thing is that once you get to that 7 mana, the value from that 7 mana is absolutely amazing. I don't think this commander is going to drop too far, I think it might end up in A tier and stay in A tier, or maybe go down to B tier and then go up to A tier and just jump around between B and A. But I don't personally think it's going to keep the S tier level. Now I gave CC a long rant and a deck tech showcase, so it's only proper that we also make a Atraxa deck tech showcase and like similar for all of the S tier commanders. This is actually very typical what I usually see inside Atraxa. Displacer Kitten and Emil are very interesting inside Atraxa because you can flicker Atraxa with them and that just usually takes over the game quite fast. I have seen people play Phyrexian Metamorph into their Atraxa then sacrificing the Phyrexian Metamorph to the graveyard but usually just using it as a big value card. Also Phyrexian Metamorph is a card that's like performing quite okay in general anyways so usually have like an opponent's dock side, you can copy with this. And then if you have your Displacer Kitten and an opponent's dock side, which means you have the Displacer, Phyrex and Metamorph combo assembled. Cooling Ritual is usually performing amazing. Here is the Mnemonic Betrayal again. Food Chain, a typical combo some Atraxa decks are going for. Smothering Tide. I mean, you are in the end playing a four-colored commander, 
which is just opening up a lot of different possibilities and tweaks you can do towards your specific deck desire. So we looked at an older commander deck with an A win rate from a tournament, 6 wins and 1 draw, 85 average win rate. But if we go here and look at the most recent tournament, the one I mentioned in the beginning of the video, CDH Top Deck Expo, we can see here that Atraxa didn't perform so well in this one. If we take a look at, uh, let's just go, go with this one, Eric Farmer, who won one game and lost four games. This is his deck list. He's also playing Displacer Kitten, but no Emil. He's playing Cooling Ritual, but not Mnemonic Betrayal. I think that's the mistake. We have the One Ring, we have Food Chain, we have Smothering Tight, but in general, pretty similar. Next on the list is Blue Farm with 372 deck entries, which is making it the most popular commander pair played in various tournaments. This is the thing that most people are playing, basically. It's sitting on amazing average win rate of 26.04, and as you can see, plus 0.35, which means it's actually going up. So sometimes I get the comment when I say that Nayela isn't showcasing the best performance in general. That some people say that a bunch of casual players or people that aren't as good at playing Nayela are playing it and dragging the win rate down. And sure, that could be true, but it would should also be true for Team Nadweaver and Krom. And we have more game entries with this commander pair, which should mean that theoretically we have more bad players or more people that don't know how to play this specific commander compared to the amount of bad players playing Nayela. Once again, once you have a really high sample size, you're removing the player skill factor more and more. And you're getting a picture of the true performance from Tim and Krom in general. Because even though you're a bad pilot, even though you don't have huge skill inside this game, Picking this commander usually gives you a pretty good chance of getting a pretty decent win rate and performance in a tournament. That's just pretty much a fact. Similar to how I showcased Cise, I don't think I can with this commander pair because they just have so many different versions. You can build Tumna and Krom extremely turbo, but you can also play it extremely mid-range. You can even play it stacksy, which is something I kinda do sometimes. Truth be told, you can play Tim and Krom in so many different variations of ways, which is a good thing, because it can adapt. Depending on what you feel that you need for the specific tournament you're going towards, where you predict your opponent's gonna be kind of this stuff, you can change your build to be adapted towards whatever meta you could consider. And access to four different colors is just giving you more options. In the end, they don't have a single combo in their card from the command zone, they only have a lot of card draw. I personally believe that Blue Farm is going to stick around in S tier, maybe drop down to A tier now and then, but it's gonna be an S tier commander and definitely to be considered among the best commander in the format. Next up, we have Tropical Malcolm. I even put Glintorn in there just to showcase what it's actually up to. But basically, you have 63 decks playing the Tiamur, Malcolm, and Tana, and you have an average win rate of 26.25. So, in the making of this video and in the making of this most recent tournament, this is currently the best commander in the entire format. I've had Atraxa being the best commander, I have had Dargo and Frasius being the best commander, and I'm gonna say the exact same thing I said about those two commanders as well. This is currently winning the um, under the radar combo basically. You have a one card win con from the command zone with the color identity of green. That is very good at tutoring for creatures. So I mean one card creature combo is kinda good. Especially the part where your opponents can't counterspell a Glintorn on the stack with a Force of Negation or Flusterstorm, or a Swan Song for that matter, either. You're basically one tutor away from winning the game, more or less. But over time, I truly believe that this commander pair is going to drop. I don't. I, I think it definitely could stay in S tier for quite a while, but I think it's A tier material. 
I might even say that over time it might drop into B tier as well, where you have an average win rate of below 25%. So we will see. But for now, it's kind of performing really well. But also, once again, like I said with Tumna, no, with Dargo and Frasius, only good players were playing that commander. So I think it's similar thing here that only good, or not, not only, but a majority of the players that have brought this to a tournament are good at this specific commander. That takes us to Rograk and Silias, Rogsai. 162 deck entries and an average win rate of 25.90, so it's very close to 26 average win rate. I want to talk quite a lot here. So, first of all, they are considered the fastest turbo deck possible, because free to cast creature means that you're cooling the weak. Let's actually take a look at the deck list while we're talking about it. So here we have a Sane, who's played this commander. Creatures, Birgi, Dockside, Orkish, Ragavan, Seaman Spirit Guide, and Fasus Oracle. But the big thing are Infernal Plunge and Cooling the Weak. So with Rograk free to cast and Cooling the Weak in your hand, you're very close to an Ad Nauseum, which you have basically in this deck. This is the reason why it's considered the fastest combo possible, just because of that free to cost Rogsai. For example, you have, where is the, here's Paradise Mantle, but you also have Mox Amber, there it is, Mox Amber, which is more or less a Mox Ruby in this commander deck. Early Rogsai also activates Deflecting Swat and Fierce Guardianship early in the game. Silas is basically just there for color identity, so you're getting that Grixis color identity. And that's usually the weakness for this commander pair, is that it's very hard to adapt. For example, let's just pretend that Turbo is going to struggle for some reason. The difference between Blue Farm and Rogsai is that Blue Farm can adapt. You can change it, you can make it more adapted towards that, while it's very hard for Rogsai to become a mid-range deck, because in the end, the commanders are nothing, they are only fast turbo for a combo, but they are not combo pieces in the command zone, you have no card draw whatsoever in the command zone, you literally only have a fast free to cast commander and free color Grixis, which is good, but compared to like four colors and great card draw, that's a difference. Now if the goal is or the best thing is to be turbo fast, then yeah, Rogsai is going to dominate. And playing turbo is always considered to be good, so I think it's going to stick around in a S tier or A tier level, but I don't think it's going to be like the best commander in the format ever. Then we have the absolute last commander pair to look at, which is Frasius Smasher. And now some of you are gonna say, but Mons, they are the actual best commanders inside this format. And some of you others are going to say that the result is not statistically significant because the amount of decks aren't enough. And both of you are correct. However, 29 decks, I think it's pretty good. I think that we can trust the data in some form of way. But I'm not saying that it's the best commander just because of that. Because we kind of want to see more than 29 games to make a verdict. But still, Frasius and Smasher have a 29 total games entries into various tournaments so far, I think it's going to increase, and they are sitting on an average win rate of 26.62. You're basically gaining an amazing color, four different colors, sans white, no white, but who cares? But you get a outlet from the command zone, a card draw from the command zone in forms of Frasius, but also you get a infinite mana outlet, if you can achieve infinite mana somehow. But a similar thing with blue farm in you're getting so many different colors, you can really build the commander in so many different variations of ways. For example, this one. Here you have Leveler and Fasas Oracle. I didn't expect that when I clicked on this decklist link, but it just showcased my point truly. So where is it? Where is the Divergent? There it is. Divergent Transformation. I mean, Francis and Smasher actually started, this was actually the, f so, okay, fun fact, here's some history for you. Francis and Smasher in 2016 was the first Divergent deck ever, because you gained access to red and two really cheap to cast commanders from the command zone. So if you cast Divergent, 
you're starting to exile uh, flip cards from your library until you flip into two creatures which is gonna be Fesas Oracle and the Leveler. You actually went with Notion Thief and a strange wheel creature, which meant that you just took all cards from all your opponent's hand and made them yours, which is similar to a Notion Thief and a Wheel of Fortune. They called the deck Divergent Control and it was a pretty amazing deck to be honest. But this deck has moved into Leveler and Fesas Oracle. You can actually swap the Leveler to Spellseeker and use the Spellseeker to find Demonic Consultation or Tainted Pact. Now bear that deck in mind and let's go back here and look for this Bonefire deck and let's see at this deck list. So here we have a more standard deck list from I fell into a burning ring of fire boom 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 by... Uh, can't pronounce that, I'm sorry. But we have some more stats, like typical things like Dockside Tiamur, Fasas, Oppo, Orkish, Phyrix and Metamor, Phantasmal, we have a Culling, Ritual, we have Adnos, the One Ring, Andul Breach, you're getting the picture. Whenever you have like four colors, the Commanders doesn't really impact that much, which is actually one of the reasons why Kendriff is doing so good, because you have five colors. You basically play this, but adding white. But Phrasis is a really cheap to cost commander, and you can truly build this deck similar to a Grixis turbo combo strategy, just adding green to it, which opens up a little bit more rituals and some other cool utilities. For those that don't believe me when I say that adding green to Grixis is great, I mean, take a look at this, Elvish Spirit Guide, which is another version of Simeon Spirit Guide, also cooling the ritual, is really good. And yeah, green gives you access to that. But you can easily adapt this to whatever you need. Just like how Cise and Blue Farm can be adapted to whatever you need. Other commanders like Nayella and Vinota and some other commanders here and there are struggling in being that adaptive commander basically. And that is once again why I believe that this commander pair is going to actually stay around this. So even though the result is not statistically significant, and even though the total decks are very low, I actually believe that the win rate is somewhat accurate. It might drop a tiny bit, but I think it's gonna stick around inside A tier. That I truly believe. Those were the five S tier, the best of the best, five best commanders currently, and that summarized the entire CDH tier list. But I should mention that it is definitely going to be something that is changing over time and time. For example, here, this is the CDH tier list before the most recent tournaments. And if we do something like this, you're noticing that a few commanders are jumping around. Some are leaving A tier and some are leaving B tier and just swapping positions basically. And once we are starting to have more games from these commanders so that they actually get a placement inside the tier list, we might start to actually get a better picture of what is this best commander inside this entire format. Because I don't think that this is set in stone. I think we're close. I think what you're looking at right now is quite close to being something of the best. But if I'm gonna be honest, I do really believe that some of these commander are going to be contenders. Uh, maybe not for S tier all of them, but some of them will definitely be fighting inside the A tier section. Time will tell. I will continuously to calculate data from various different commanders entering into various different tournaments trying to pull information and knowledge from it and sharing it here on this YouTube channel. I truly believe this is a good approach into trying to understand what cards are good and what commanders are recommended. And I hope that's your view as well. And as we have started to look into a CDH commander tier list, as I mentioned soon, we will have a combo and stacks and counterspell tier list as well.